Bob Grossman from the University of Chicago. So uh, Bob is an interesting fellow in many ways. He a, has a PhD in mathematics, but uh, uh, was an early pioneer in, in big data before it was called that, before it was called only called medium data, I, I guess. No. <laughs> Not really, but uh, data. It was just called data, yes. That's the, another, the punchline to another joke. What do people call big data in Texas? They just call it data. You know, same thing, right? But, uh, yeah. yeah. A friend of a, a fellow I shared uh, an office with a, as an undergrad wrote a book some years ago called Managing Gigabytes, and that was a big deal uh, some time ago. Now, of course, uh, well, Bob, in fact, as he's going to tell us, is engaged in the process of managing petabytes. But you, yeah, what I wanted to say is Bob, Bob was an early pioneer in, in uh, data mining and has done really influential work in that area. But we were lucky enough, uh, and we were lucky enough to attract him to the University of Chicago in 2016, where he's played a big role in, in transforming how uh, data uh, and computing is uh, handled in, in the biological sciences division. So thank you, Bob. Oh, and I have an announcement. If you're going to, we're recording this. Um, so if you're going to say something that, uh, well, you, if you're going to say something, it will be good if you've got a mic so we capture what, what you're saying. Yeah. ...time in terms of a number of things, in terms of the amount of data available, in terms of the platforms we have for bringing data together, analyzing, sharing it, there's a whole sort of... Um, transition that's um, taking place in the platforms and in the types of analysis we could do over big data. So I've been motivated by the following question. Um, you could, um, you, you can ask the question is if we could improve the sharing of biomedical data, could we reduce the disease burden? And by that I mean could you actually show that by increasing the sharing of biomedical data along whatever dimension you want, could you sort of decrease, uh, increase the length of life or decrease the quality of life for the same length, you know, the classical definition of disease burden. You can model that. So that's what's motivated me the last, you know, I, I would say eight years is, you know, what are the platforms that you could put in and what are the policies that by sharing data you could um, uh, sort of decreased disease burden. And um, I want to tell you about um, some of the, um, one of the platforms um, that we're, we're thinking of. And this is from a, a center, I don't think most people know about this, but we're looking for collaboration. So we're, this is sort of one of the standard definitions of data science, where it's the uh, intersection of computer science, math, stat, and the discipline. And here the discipline is biology, medicine, and healthcare. And so we, we're tentatively using the term translational data science in a, in a slightly different way it's normally used by the sort of data science and its applications to biology, medicine, and healthcare and the environment. That is, how do you translate things um, from data science to, in, to have an impact in biology, medicine, healthcare, and the environment? And um, I, the older I get, the fewer opinions I have. So I actually don't have an opinion on what's big or what's small. Um, and I, um, I, I have an opinion that you should always use the best statistics you or your friends or your colleagues can use. But we've sort of been on this journey, um, you know, to work with larger data sets because of this question, you know, if, if the data is available, could you um, share it and dec share it in a secure and compliant way, but decrease disease burden. And so we built a system in 2008 that sort of was, a, a, in 2010 was about the petabyte scale. We're, we just announced a system that's operational now. It's used by, by about 1,000 to 3,000 people a day called the Genomic Data Commons that's uh, sort of at the 10 petabyte scale. And we're sort of trying to scale up to the 100 to exabyte scale over the next few years. And we're looking for sort of technology partners to do that. So I, 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 I want to sort of start with the question. Um, the platform is called a data commons. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. I want to talk about the kind of statistics it enables. And I want to explain why you might want to care. Um, so there have been 
lots and lots of meetings at NIH, lots of National Academy studies about sort of the amount of data sensors are generating and the problems that's creating. And nothing really happened um, um, except, you know, people like writing these, these uh, National Academy studies and um, National, you know, Institute of Medicine studies. But sort of what happened is sort of here, um, this is an artist characteristic of the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is, you know, in whatever dimension you look at it, um, healthcare costs are increasing, but the amount of data available for fundamental research is constant and, you know, shrinking depending upon how you look at inflation. So uh, what broke was there just wasn't enough data for the current, the past and almost current paradigm to work, which was you g gave a, a researcher or a research group uh, a grant, they downloaded the data, they built an infrastructure, they uh, made the infrastructure secure and compliant, they um, sort of got the systems and the networking to work, uh, they got the bioinformaticians, um, and with the data growing almost exponentially and with resources flat, and with the attack vectors increasing, that just wasn't a viable model. So more or less, something had to change. And I want to talk about some of the changes taking place and some of their relevance um, because of the rise of data, constant dollars, and the increasing complexity for working with the tools. And you know, um, Ian is one of the experts on sort of one of the approaches, sort of cloud-based approaches with Globus and Globus Genomics. Um, I, I'm going to talk about a sort of complementary approach that actually interoperates with that called a commons. And um, as Ian pointed out, um, you know, um, I was trained as a mathematician. Mathematics, you're supposed to define things. I guess in other areas, it's not required. Um, and so the N NIH um, has written lots of um, white papers on commons, but they were never defined. And so. You may not like this definition, but it's, it's a definition. A commons when, is when you co-locate uh, storage, compute, put core services over there, like you, you can give a unique name, globally unique name that's citable in literature to any data set. You can use that name to sort of tell you what the metadata is. So you have core services like that. And then you could put the tools for analyzing and sharing data over that. You can run that as an instrument and you, uh, we call that uh, um, uh, a commons that's, uh, uh, and it's compatible with NIH definitions of commons. The good news is some of their um, common prototypes are coming on board. There is a commons credit RFA, so shortly um, there'll be a number of very nice commons um, out there for people to use. Um, and it's interoperable in the sense that Bob just asked. So I want to talk about this. That's actually one of the commons um, at the, we built at the University of Chicago. That's the Kenwood Data Center, and that's, we have a row or uh, several rows. We have, a, I guess, about half the Kenwood Data Center. So I want to talk about the NCI, and I, my interest is in here is what new types of analysis you could do. So, for example, um, in one of the commons we built, we have CMS data. And so what that means is if you, have to, you want to analyze CMS data, we have the ability in this commons to, um, we know who you are, you log in through your um, UChicago or your um, uh, Internet 2 credentials and we can check if you have um, access to that data and then we can sort of give you um, access to that data with commonly used tools and commonly used um, derived data sets and that's a structure that's one of the things we, we do. I, I think that's pretty limited now, but it'd be easy to add other people to that. That's an example of a commons. Um, you know, um, there's this sort of ambiguity of when CMS gives you data, are they giving you, you, you can ask, are they giving you a particular data set that has to live in a certain place, or are they giving you the right to look at that data set as an abstract entity? You know, the sort of the platonic sense of data. If you take the platonic sense of that data, then um, you know, you can go then to any commons that, and as long as you have the right to that data through a signed data use agreement, um, then you should be able to, and your use of that data is compatible with the data contributors agreement. That's sort of the, the way we look at this. You, sh you can sort of use this data in a commons. So I want to talk about a commons that's just launched on June 6. Um, the, the sort of one way to look at the scale of data is, is the scale of data, um, the amount of data that you use yourself, is it the data in your collaboration, 
Is it the data, say, in a hospital? Is it the data in the hospital system? Or is it the data, you know, if you're a funding agency, you could say your unit of data is the data in the funding agency. And if you're an OSTP, you could say your unit of data is the data sort of in the nation, um, um, either federally, you know, would divide between federally funded, privately, and, you know, data and companies. So NCI, and, you know, um, a number of us over the years uh, sort of, sort of articulated this and sort of they, you know, ran a number of meetings. NCI took the point of view, which I think was very courageous, to say their unit of data is the data for NCI-funded researchers. And then um, they are building several systems that will hold that data. So one of the systems is the NCI Genomic Data Commons, um, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that system. So if you're an NCI-funded researcher and you're subject to genomic data sharing, then you have to add your data here. And there's an article coming out um, that's going to sort of explain that from an NCI perspective, this includes clinical trials data. So, um, and again, this is, you know, we architected this commons. This commons is interoperable in the way that Bob was talking about. So and I'll talk a little bit about what it means to be interoperable. And also the data in this commons, um, we sort of um, uniformly analyze it so that the kinds of things that I know Bob worries about, um, we can minimize. You know, there's still batch effects. Um, it's, it's, an, it's one of those things that if you take genomic and associated clinical data from multiple sites, prepared with different procedures, analyzed with different algorithms, um, then just look at the downstream variants and then bring them together, um, Bob, wouldn't be uh, Bob wouldn't be surprised, but many people are surprised that the dominant, um, you know, that you're dominated by batch effects and all you see is the source of the data, you don't see this, the, 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 um, the variance. And so here, there's a uniform analysis and we strongly encourage people to sort of use the, the best principles. Um, so this is, it's, it's, um, it's a system that um, is designed um, to sort of, again, hold NC, uh, research from any NCI-funded uh, uh, project that's subject to genomic data sharing. So I'll come back to what genomic data sharing is if you don't know it, but these are sort of, if you generate any substantial amount of data, 100 samples or more typically, you have to put your data in here. And then we will consistently reanalyze it, and then we interoperate with computing resources that you can sort of pay for your compute as you go. It could be a university resource, it could be a public cloud, it could be um, uh, individual research um, supported by NCI where they'll give you chits. And uh, again, as I mentioned, other NIH commons are being built and we will interoperate with those too. Um, so th the way we think of this system is it's, a, it's an underlying framework so that we build apps over it. So one app is the, uh, and the reason I'm telling you this is I'm trying to encourage, you know, people to build apps. So this data is there and it's interoperable as Bob was saying, so we encourage people to build apps. Um, one of the apps we built was this portal so that you can look at it. I think, well, it's, it's pretty, you just search for genomic data commons, you can find the portal. Um, another app we built uh, was a submission system so people can submit data. Um, and it's not so easy as Jonathan knows to submit data because um, you have to submit the genomic data, the biospecimen data, the clinical data, the projects. We each have a separate clinical data dictionary. Then we try to sort of take a common, um, we try to support the, all the clinical data in, the, in that project as well as a common, so we could, common core elements that we could do. So um, the third app we did was, a, was a basically a computation system. So this is our sort of for us to compute over the data there, it's about four petabytes. It, you know, it takes on the order of 10 million core hours. And so, um, and we try to sort of run commonly used algorithms over, there, over this, um, but sort of, and then we sort of make that available as a derived product so anyone coming to the commons can use it and anyone interoperating with the commons can use these clean data sets of derived data. And there's a community process. So if a community decides they want certain derived data, we can sort of run that over the entire system. So this, this idea, which is an old idea of reanalysis, a lot of what we did was design this system to be efficient for the reanalysis of all the data. So that means that if a new algorithm for alignment, if a new algorithm for variant finding, 
if a new algorithm is for a gene fusion, if a new algorithm is for structural rearrangement for RNA quantification comes out, that algorithm through a sort of a, a committee can ru be run over all the data in the commons and then be made available. So you could just take sort of a gigabyte size downstream set instead of the petabyte size data and then you can interoperate with that. You could also ask for slices of data. So if you just are interested in a particular chrom chromosome, the API will ask, say, give me all the variants over, you know, in, in, this, in this range on the, along the genome or give me all the data for this particular tag of data, you know, if you're interested in a particular gene or something. Um, and so th this, is, um, this is driven by two things. Uh, this is driven by the fact that we wrote, you know, the, our commons infrastructure is just a way to hold data, to manage it securely and compliantly, and then to support access to it through an API where everything in, these, in this data is given a unique ID, and that unique ID is sort of, you know, is citable, um, it's linkable to publications, and you can sort of just get the data to any of the IDs in here. And this is, this is in fact how we build the data submission system, it's how we build uh, the data portal, it's how we build the analysis system. And um, we have someone who sort of is, we have a, a donor um, for one of our projects who's um, offering some prize money of, I think, uh, five and $10,000 to anyone who builds the most interesting, and we're defining interesting with the committee, the most interesting app um, over this a API. And so from that viewpoint, you know, one of our definitions of interesting we'll show you is, you know, can you find a misdiagnosis that if, um, if corrected would lead to the largest decrease in disease burden. So that's one of the uh, kinds of things we're trying to make um, precise enough so we could decide who wins this contest. But it, it's all, you know, trying to encourage people to interoperate over this app. And so this is an example of that. We did this a little while ago in the top left are the Kaffir-Meyer curves. This is data from one of the data sets in the TCGA. Um, the purple balls are lung adenocarcinoma. The gray balls are squamous cell carcinoma. If I had more time, I could show you the histology. The, the, the histology for these two things look pretty close, so it's, it's pretty hard to distinguish them, and it's, it's presumably subject to errors. So depending upon the audience, if I say that, people get very emotional, and they jump up and tell me there are no errors. So I, there may be no errors, but um, the, 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 these balls are colored by the uh, diagnosis when the data was submitted to the um, TCGA project, the Cancer Genome Atlas project. And what we did is we, we took the RNA-seq data, we did a, some pretty standard normalizations, we did um, an analysis in 400 dimensions, we did a principal components and we're projecting down to two and three dimensions of the principal components for visualization. The analysis is in all the principal components. And um, this is basically, it's pretty clear that the, um, that there's, if you do this, there's a simple SVM, there's a simple separating hyperplane between these two data sets um, with this analysis. And when you do that, the green, if I were to rotate this in three dimensions, it's a, it's a shiny R and you could just sort of rotate it. There's a clean separating hyperplane. Um, the greens are pretty clearly misdiagnosed. And then when you play with the um, Meyer-Kaplan curves and there's a little, some of these things are given to Bastin and some aren't, the, if you're misdiagnosed, you seem to lose about, uh, at least from this data, from the Meyer-Kaplan curves, you lose about, um, your survival rate goes down in half. So you could argue from this, um, from this data, and I'm not saying it generalizes, I'm just saying this is data that's at the largest data set right now of, um, of uh, cancer genome data. Um, there seems to be a simple, a number of simple tests which would um, have the action, and I'm not talking causality, and you know, so um, there's, there's how we analyze this, there's the theory of it, there's the causal analysis. I'm just talking about a very simple experiment that you would have to do as we just heard, I don't know where, okay. We just heard about these sort of longitudinal uh, designs and quasi-experimental designs. You could ask the question, if um, I were to use this as a diagnostic criteria, 
I have the survival curves, I were to compute the, uh, the Meyer-Kaplan, if the criterion is to um, correct the, make the diagnosis based on this uh, separating hyperplane versus the clinical, the current diagnosis, you could ask how many disease years were generated, and you know, the action is to use this to diagnose so I'm not saying it's causal, but that is the same thing if you take a certain action on uh, hospital readmission. It's sometimes, you know, you, it may take you several years to understand the causality, but if the action results in less readmissions, it's not a bad starting point. And I think that's how we're looking at it here. Um, did I, uh, yeah, let me not talk about this because I'm running out of time. This is, I, I want to talk about, um, once you have this and you could sort of, um, um, we have this notion of piggybacking a computation. Um, so this is unpublished, so I guess we should publish it quickly because we're being. Um, <laughs> I guess we did. <laughs> um, we have this notion of a, of a, of a wheel um, and other things uh, for computation that if for these long running computations, where we sort of take a few months to, uh, to, to run through all these. It's fairly easy to put another pipeline along the same way and you could just drag it along. Sometimes this is called a Ferris wheel computation. And in a Ferris wheel computation, you scan all the data and it might take a long time, but the cost to put another pipeline in there um, because of this is kind of incremental. So we're trying to set up in the environmental commons, we support these Ferris wheel computations where if you want to batch your analytic along with ours and then just run it over all the data, all the environmental data, it's fairly easy. So this is a computation we batched and um, we just did another clustering of all these diseases um, based on the, um, the RNA data that, and a new clustering algorithm based on all the RNA data, RNA-seq data in the, in the commons, and we sort of get these results um, just because we, it's, it's, it's a scale of computation that's not easy to do on your own. Similarly, this, this is unpublished, so maybe we'll do this quickly too. Um, that was a description of all the viruses in all of the, uh, in all of the uh, 14,500 uh, cancer, uh, uh, cases that we have in TCGA, and you could see we know a lot about some viruses, but when you do this at scale, some of these other viruses, which are their genetic sequences in the tumors, pops up very naturally. And so these are just sort of drag-along computations you could do when you can sort of run these things at this scale. Here's another example. This is, um, we, we asked for 100 million medical records from Truven could we rank order, we, we truncated the ICD-9 codes and we got um, sort of about 800 diseases and we just asked the question, which rank order these diseases based upon how sensitive they were geospatially? And we're not doing causality, we're just asking to rank order these diseases based upon their geospatial sensitivity. So I guess, and you see things like I didn't show them for lack of time, but um, some were obviously correlated with socioeconomic variables, and you could just see that visually, and you can verify that with mixed effects models. Some were environmentally correlated, and you know some of these seem to be pretty well known, some aren't, and some are what you might call, uh, I guess we have experts here, we call them structural, which means they seem to correlate with payer provider boundaries. And so um, it's, you know, one of the things we're doing now is overlaying this data um, sort of in a mathematical way to the, um, to all the genomic data here. So I, I want to sort of um, talk um, about, you know, how general a commons is. And so uh, we've, we've built five commons and we're in the process of bringing out some disease specific commons. And so part of this is it's an open source software stack. So we we have a commons for genomic data, genomic and associated clinical data from NCI. We have a commons with, from, with NASA where we have satellite observational data, and we have a commons with NOAA where we have some of NOAA's data, and we have a sort of a, 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 a biomedical commons where we put our CMS and other sort of sensitive data. But it's the, it's the same software stack, it's the same ways we operate it, um, and you know, um, we're just trying to sort of make it easier for people to make discoveries. I think we're getting near 
to 750 to 1,000 research projects that have used this infrastructure over the last few years. So um, we've come up with a philosophy of how to do this. I'm only going to talk about two or three of them because I'm interested in data sharing. Um, I talked a little bit about the permanent IDs. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we call peering. I've talked a fair amount about why we use an API. I haven't talked about portable. Um, so at scale, um, the, something that seems to be quite practical is to ask for two commons like this to interoperate at no cost. Now that's asking a lot. Now why is that not absurd? Um, for, so if what we mean by interoperate is they will pass research data, this is sort of how the internet was formed. The internet was formed by taking a handful, less than a dozen, large internet service providers and they agreed to pass traffic at no cost to each other and basically benefit by scale of the ecosystem and let all the downstream users of that system pay full cost to the person who provided them access. That created the internet. It's not such a bad model. Um, and um, the, the way they did that is they took fixed cost devices, routers, and they just sort of shared those routers in a handful of places in the country and that created interoperability. So what we mean by data peering is just this notion that if you have two commons and if you're accessing data by ID, then those commons should exchange research data um, at no cost between them and make, the transparent, make it accessible transparently to anyone at any of the commons. So this researcher and this researcher as long as they ask for the, that data by ID, um, can do that at no comment. So this is no problem for commons at university. It's a big problem because a lot of the funding agencies are putting commons in public clouds and public clouds don't have this model. So it's, it's, it's not, they could adopt this model at fixed cost and the funding agencies could pick it up, but the, 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 the way public clouds where um, a number of federal agencies are putting their data work is they want the data to come in but not to leave. And that's a reasonable model because when the data is in there, they can monetize it. And when the data is gone, it's hard for them to monetize it. So um, this is sort of a somewhat controversial idea, but it's one of the sort of principles we're trying to do. I, I talked a little bit about the APIs, you know, in the API contest. Let me talk a little bit about portability. So one of the most significant changes to sharing of data came, um, what time did I start? 10.45, okay. One of the most significant changes came to the blue button. Who, who's used the blue button? You're kind of young to do it. So this was, this is a, a OSTP directive that led to this. Uh, Ravi, he knows this technology, which is good because we need you to use this technology. So the blue button has, is, is, let me tell you what it is, let me tell you why it's important, and let me tell you why it's going to become more important in the future. So the blue button, um, one of the largest collections of um, uh, phenotype data is in the VA system. And the blue button gives the end. Um, normally, if you think about it, when you have an interaction with a provider, uh, a hospital or something, the provider owns that data. Um, and once the provider owns the data, if they try to share that data, they really just increase their liability. They have very little incentive to share data because, it's, it, because of the way the current policies are written. It just increases their liability. The blue button said that anyone can have the right to download their data. So that if, you, if you're a veteran whose data is in the, the VA, you can download the data and it's your data. And then an ecosystem is being um, generated around um, essentially blue button compatible systems so that you can, the VA can then gift their data or lend their data or share their data with other systems that are compatible. And you know this, you know, for many people, this is a scary thing. But this is fundamentally a fundamental change. I mean, the 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 way the NCI Commons is going to evolve 
is we're, we, uh, right now we work with projects that are NCI funded, but anyone's allowed to give us their data if it's a certain size or not, because there's a certain cost to take it. But so if you have 100 samples with associated clinical data, you can give your data. But over time, the idea is to open up the, uh, the, that commons to anyone who wants to submit the data, that is to have patient gifted or patient gener uh, donated data. So if you go to a provider um, and you can download your data, then we can, um, over time, we'll accept that data through a commons apparatus. And so this is the shift, which is, you know, NCI is supportive of the, of moving who owns the data from the uh, provider to the patient and then setting up um, mechanisms so the patients can then give their data in a meaningful way with the proper consent so it could be used for particular studies. And so one of these things, we think of this as data portability, that no matter where your data is, commons have to be portable. So um, this is, it's a little complicated, but this is how we see what a commons is. It's, um, you know, you, anyone could build apps over it in a secure and compliant way. We build a small amount of software. There's a lot of other software, both open source, et cetera, um, and proprietary. There's, it's really governed by the governance. So for example, if we have a, in the BioNimbus uh, commons we build, if you put CMS data, it's really governed by the way CMS, I think everyone knows, but the way we get it here is the university, as the, I forget, as the institutional sponsor, makes certain assertions that you'll honor the data use agreement and, um, um, and it's consistent with the data contributor agreement by which CMS got the data. And so that governance structure has to support this. And then there's data in the, in the commons that are sort of, um, um, a given provider provides, a given common service providers, and then those that peer with that. And so in principle, it, um, anything over here, so the way we check if you have access to the data is we check, um, you log in, say, with one of your standard login credentials, your university login credentials, and then um, if you want access to particular data, we know where that data, where, where the sort of the, the um, credentials where the uh, data access agreements for that are kept electronically. So if it's um, NIH, it's in a system called dbGaP. If it's for the International Genome Consortium, in this, it's a system for, it's a system call, called the ICGC DACO. If it's um, a system we run and say it's CMS, then we keep a database of who's allowed to look at that. So we check the, the credentials and then, um, you know, pre the, it, this, this credential checking can check here, and then you can compute over it, and it can be computed sort of in sort of um, multi-institutional clouds, on-premise clouds like the University of Chicago or public clouds. So I'm gonna skip that. Um, so the, the way, I, I think this is this disruption I was talking about, and I wanna put it into historical context. This disruption is the emergence of the commons, and I give NIH, a lot of credit for it. There are a number of commons they're building that's coming out. Is this is a new type of data sharing platform? It supports interoperability of apps in a fairly restricted way. It's not asking for massive federation of uh, large numbers of systems, which is kind of hard to work. You know, it's more structured on a, you know dozens to hundreds of systems interoperating, which is sort of more of an internet model. Um, at least as we build our commons, we're, stru we're structuring these so researchers can give us their anal analysis and we can add them. And our basic business is to reanalyze data. And this is pretty, imp oh. this is pretty important in that um, in some, most, in, at least in biomedical sciences, the algorithms are changing so rapidly that unless you have the raw data and um, you can't normally take a new algorithm or a new application or a new statistical method and run it over all the data. If you just have the downstream data, you're precluded from that. And so th this, the reason this is a much harder problem is we keep all the raw data. So as our new algorithms come, we could reanalyze all the data with that. Um, and then I don't like this term. Um, the Institute of Medicine report was a knowledge network. But what this means is there's an interoperating system that's manageable in which data could be annotated. And probably the, the most important annotation is um, what we'll call strength of evidence databases. So the efficacy, toxicity 
of a drug or combination of drugs over a date of a particular genomic strata. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so, I, so where were we? I said what a data commons was. I showed my favorite examples I can't really show you because they're not yet published of what you could do. Um, so the big question to me is this disease burden question. Um, so we're in this difficult situation now is that it's extremely difficult to sort of operate at this scale for most organizations. So there are going to be a handful of players who can do this. So the, the question out there, for certain diseases, it's, it's rel you know, if the disease is simple enough, then you don't need that much data and you can, you know, multiple groups can get the data they need, they can analyze it, they can understand causality, and they can know what to do. For certain diseases that seem quite complicated, and, you know, we st cancer seems to be like this, at least with our current understanding, if I take a particular genome, if I take a particular tumor, and I take your normal, you know, your saliva or your bloodline genome, and I have those and I sequence those, and I ask what drug or combination of drugs will be most effective at a particular time against that tumor, um, that seems to be a very, very complicated question, and it seems to require a lot of data. So from that viewpoint, um, there are a number of companies out there who are sort of building very good project, uh, very good companies by buying up the data and sort of um, selling it back to the, uh, to the providers so they can make better decisions. And the question is, um, you know, how, is there going to be a critical mass enough, uh, uh, enough data left that could be shared to sort of drive these questions? And so a part of our goal is to support an infrastructure that's compatible with this. And I, I think most people in the room, okay, most people in, in the room um, know this pretty well, but I I'm sort of took a sort of a, uh, a 30 year uh, review of um, what are the principles for data sharing in genomics and, and clinical medicine, when it happened, um, what the major projects are that produce the data, and what the systems are that allow that data to be used. And in, 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 in I think I can end with this. You know, in 1969, the Bermuda principles were, were articulated, which said basically sequence data for the human beings as an organism had to be shared within 24 hours. And that created, that supported the Human Genome Project. It created multi, multiple billion, you know, a billion dollars, billions and billions of dollars of a commercial ecosystem around. And it sort of was consistent with sort of the view of, um, you know, how funding agencies should do this. This was DOE and NIH and the international counterparts. Um, this was data at the level of the organism. Right now, we're at the data at the level of the individual, and it's more complicated. So a big change was in 2007, where dbGaP talked about controlled access data because we had genomic data at the individual level. You know, what was the process to make that available? Um, and this was, you know, the Cancer Genome Atlas and GTEC came out. GTEC, um, as Jonathan, GTEC was from all from dead people, so it wasn't tricky, but TCJ was from alive people. And the reason I say we're at a disrupted change is things are fundamentally changing right now. There's a new NIH genomic data sharing policy. Um, um, a number of us are building systems that are massively scale. Our unit now are sort of in principle the, all the people in the world. And um, you still, um, you still, you have controlled access data about individuals and you have to think about how you're going to do this securely compliant with consent, but you have the ability to build apps, links, and APIs over these commons and interoperate. And I'm not going to go through, through this in detail, but there's sort of three swim lanes that make sense. One is the discovery swim lane, one is the patient care swim lane, and one is the quality and, pa and, and patient safety swim lane. Um, there's uh, outcome and there's translation. There's systems being built by the government, such as the Genomic Data Commons, by not-for-profits, and by commercial companies. And this is a, you know, um, a very important ecosystem. And um, one of the things that um, we're in the process of doing is moving from the discovery side 
to the same thing for the strength of evidence side so that we can begin to create an open resource that, that can be used. So, um, time for what, a question? Okay. And it may not be so much of a data question as a thought question, but um, I'm interested in the translation to policy from all of the big findings that come out of big data. Um, Tamara, your point about uh, all this effort to promote um, care coordinators, which was probably a big policy push based on some data at some point, but then you know, we sort of get the sense from your data that when scaling it up and um, implementing it, it doesn't really work as well as we would hope. Um, are there organized dialogues to get the policymakers to keep learning? So beyond the learning health system, we need it to then go back up. And I, you know, so I yeah. The answer is yes or no. So uh, there are a lot of people thinking about this and a lot of people aren't thinking about it. I think it's complicated because of the level of disruption going on. That's what I was trying to talk about. So um, you know, in the nuclear industry, um, there was something called the Price-Anderson Act. Is that right? So I, th I think that's the, I, to me, that's the analogy. So I asked the question, you know, if we were to share more data, how many lives we could share? And what are the incentives that keep people from, people from sharing data? So, uh, you know, I'm the Chief Research Informatics Officer for the Biological Science Division here. You know, my job is to share data, but at a, a higher university level, sharing data puts a university at risk from violating HIPAA and puts fines at risk and puts a reputation at risk. So, you know, the, the way the nuclear industry dealt with this was to pass an act saying that they're, you know, that you're not going to, we needed nuclear um, um, uh, energy, but we, there were these incentives that sort of if, if something bad happened, it could sort of wipe out an individual or a company. We don't have that, so they set up a shared liability and they, you know, if you, you know, right now I would, if we were to change this and have an act, I know this is part of what the, some of the things, hope, it looks like the moonshot office is doing, is you could create that if people were well-intentioned and followed best practices and shared data and there was a downstream breach from somewhere in the ecosystem that they would go um, through, a, through a congressional act, they would go to shared liability. Everyone would have put in there, but it would not wipe that out. There would not be the reputational damage and other things. So I think the first thing is we have lots of incentives for um, not sharing data and almost no incentives for sharing data. So once you change those kinds of things, that's policy. It doesn't cost any money. It's just sort of to, you know, we pay, so we pay a lot of insurance now, but we don't have at a national level ways that data could be shared at scale. And we have these artifacts from other ar acts that keep us from doing this. So I would argue that there is, we're at a time where we, if we were to change the incentives, we're at a time if we were, because of these um, um, large platforms, that we could really fundamentally change all this. No, I guess I just have a, a slightly different perspective on it because in my kind of health policy research, it's not about data sharing because the data sharing is sort of off the table, right? It's, it's about the results and, and that was part of your question as well, right? Um, more about the, the results and getting them to listen. And I think um, on, a, on a practical level, I found CMS, for example, and, uh, and MedPAC to be incredibly responsive, right? Like send them your stuff. They won't necessarily um, read it if it's just out there in the literature, but if you send them their stuff, you'll, and they find it interesting, they'll actually you know, invite you to come in and present. And then there are other opportunities, like you know, I happen to be on CMS's technical expert panel for public reporting um, for Nursing Home Compare. And so you know, several times a year, I have a natural outlet to kind of tell them what we found. And um, anyway, I, I think it's actually just sort of a shared responsibility, like you need to send them your stuff, but they actually are interested.
So you, you, you laid out lots of really interesting problems, and the one that seems the hardest to me is the whole harmonization bit. That's a really tricky problem, particularly, and it's quite different for genotypes than phenotypes, and man, how are you going to do that? So I'm old and practical. Um, we know ground truth. We know how bad ground truth is. So um, we have a Venn diagram. So there, I guess we're still being recorded. There, um, there are variant callers, and this is well known. They are called variants, um, and we we can run them, and other groups have run them over collections of genomes. And when you look at the, at the intersection, it's disheartening. We know that by doing common pipeline, that do, doing the best practices we ha understand today for harmonization, common alignment and um, common normalization, common cleaning, common QA, that the Venn diagram improves. So since today research is being done by and large on variants produced by step separate studies that are brought together and um, you know, taking the small steps of taking whatever data we can, doing data quality and data uh, curation uniformly, and common, the common steps of pipelines in, improves the concordance. So we're sort of at this practical level. You know, there are a lot of statistical problems. We're creating some statistical challenges that people can, can do. But practically speaking, doing this this way is better than the current state of the art. And so I'm not looking for perfection. I'm just trying to get better, you know, better results out to the scientists and better results when we do. But it's a really, really hard question and we could go into that. So some of the papers coming out from our groups and other groups are just how bad things are right now and small things you could do to improve them um, and what the, what the improvement is. And that's just on the genotype side. Well, with clinical too. Yeah. Mainly genotype. Yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Fabrice Smidowskis, Public Health Sciences. I'm just curious uh, about what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, you mentioned that, NC, that NIH will be sponsoring other data commons. Well, no, they have for the last couple of years. They're coming out. Uh, Ravi, you want to talk? Which ones are coming out first? And we're working with other NIH institutes to, uh, to, to talk to them about, this technology is all open source, so we're just trying to encourage its use. What I didn't talk about, because I thought I was out of time, is, um, you, know, um, a, a lot, you know, a lot of this, you know, you have to bring together the systems, you have to bring together the software stack, you have to bring together the stats, and you have to bring in together the data. Um, one of the ideas, that sounds like a trivial idea, but it was actually quite uh, important, is, um, when you try to do this in other parts of computer science, you create typically operation centers. There's a network operation centers. When you try to do this in security, you have security operation centers. We created sort of a common service operation centers. And so um, we have an operation center that runs five commons. We're about to start some disease specific commons. So um, it's, it, you know, um, you know, at least at the research level, by creating sort of these operation centers that can run commons, you can improve um, interoperability in, in a perhaps an unexpected way. So we're sort of in the, um, uh, our main job right now is to try to support the research community and support ourselves to do better research, but we're still in this sort of plumbing phase of helping people run operations so they could bring out disease-specific commons um, that work to their benefit or, or institute-specific commons. Or like if the university wants to bring out a commons in, in, in a particular area. Yeah, Bob? I'm curious about the, the permanence of data sets. So uh, what, 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 where, uh, is that an expert yeah. there? So, so, so um, 
virtually all of <laughs> right, virtually all of the uh, the, the these uh, service centers that I'm talking about uh, are really uh, funded through grants and contracts, which means uh, they don't have permanent funding. So um, the money goes away, uh, the center goes away, the data goes away. So um, yeah. what do you have to say about yeah. that? I, I've thought a lot about that. So um, the first thing I learned is in the not-for-profit world, we use a different language. So we talk about sustainability. Now I understand what sustainability is. So there are a couple things. One of the reasons I'm so adamant about permanent IDs and portability and, and peering is if I have peering, if I have portability and if I have permanent IDs, you know, I still have standard problems, but that means that if a critical mass of people peer, then I can, I can move it to someone else. And I, so I think, you know, I didn't have time to show it. We have principles for operating commons, principles for sharing data. And um, one of the other principles for sustainability is you could say that if a procedure is going to be um, reimbursable, then it's reasonable that the data that justifies that procedure be in a commons. And so we're talking to FDA and others about how that is. So you, you have incentives like that. You can set things up. Um, each institute, so the, the genomic data, we run five or a growing number of commons. Most of them are on soft money. NCI is not our commons. We're just the guys who design, build, and operate it. It's an NCI system that one day may be somewhere else. This is the NCI system, and NCI is committed to keeping their data this way. And again, that's why, you know, we may not be doing it in a few years. That's why portability, peering, and IDs are so absolutely essential. So I think you asked the right question, but, uh, you know, there have been a lot of workshops over a lot of years that sort of ask the question, then go home and don't think about it. I actually think, you know, right now, let's say that the, the amount of data is 100 petabytes. That's, you know, with you know, with large-scale uh, internet, with large-scale comms cloud service providers having exabyte systems, it's not unfeasible at a national level to sort of deal with this. Yeah. So this is a perfect, you know, it, it, you have to be reasonable about it, but I think it's a doable problem with the right policies. 